All right, we're almost to a break. We're going to feed you, we promise. All right. Okay. Let's see how long I can go before I have an allergy attack. Um, so, um, here we are. And uh, we wanted to put together a panel for you uh, with broad perspective and synergies that we've already been able to um, create. So I have three of, uh, also again, three of our partners here uh, that we have actually been gathering information all, uh, from and probing uh, their experiences and participating in different ways. So uh, immediately close to me, we have Clint Vince. Clint Vince is a partner. He is the head of U.S. Energy Practice and the co-chair of the Global Practice on Energy for Denton's. Denton's is the largest law firm uh, in the world now. They have been on a mission. And um, they have a practice that is law, but they have a strategic practice of consultation and advisory work. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. And then I have the distinguished Jason Williams here. Um, Jason uh, has been a part of the New Orleans, and uh, can I say New Orleans? I say that. The uh, city council, the president of the council, with a absolute focus on smart cities. And um, what's interesting about the city of New Orleans and San Antonio, we actually um, have the same anniversary. We're both now 301 years old, and we got connected through Clint. Um, and uh, we actually sit on the think tank that, that Clint has through Denton's on Smart Cities. And it's been an absolute pleasure. I visited your fair city of great food. That, that's the only city I think that can rival us. Uh, and it's good food. So, but I get no break. I get to eat wherever I go. And um, then on the very end here, we have Ben Meek with Tilligent. And um, one of our senior executives, uh, Felicia Etheridge, uh, put us in contact with Utiligent and Mike Bass, I think I saw him earlier, I might have missed him, um, has, they've been working on consultation and focus on smart city, and in particular, Ben has been focused on a project that's done a lot of work in Australia, Parramatta, Australia, and we have very much been able to benchmark and listen to the experiences that they've, they've had. So we've got a wide range and we've got the ability to talk about global, we've got the ability to talk about regionalism, um, how to really kind of affect the, the city in a very special way. So these are, these are panelists for us today. Um, and I'm gonna kick it off with a question to Clint. Um, I, I actually would like you to talk about smart cities and how you think about the definition. You created something that's so simplistic, uh, but it's, it's broad. I don't want you to talk about that, and I'd like you to share with the audience the think tank and the concepts and, and how that has progressed. Thank you, Paula. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be on this panel with uh, Paula and Jason and now Ben. Paula continues to win uh, thought leadership awards about every 15 minutes. She has <laughs> been named the uh, top innovator uh, by the industry a couple of weeks ago, and next week, in D.C., the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment will give her her um, uh, Champion of the Year for 2019. Our dear friend Jason is the visionary for smart cities in New Orleans, and he created a standing committee of the council to deal uh, with smart and sustainable cities. And Ben, I just look forward to learning from you. Uh, and then, uh, first of all, I want to learn about uh, jet lag from Ben as he just flew in from uh, Parramatta, Australia. The, um, the Denton Smart Cities Think Tank uh, got formed really to, uh, we have offices in about 170 uh, locations in maybe 79 countries. And we wanted to learn from people around the world what their best practices were and uh, have an opportunity to share information. It's actually no cost to the think tank, so if, uh, if folks are interested, just send 
my uh, co-chair of our global practice, Emma Hand, is here with me. Just send Emma or me a, an email and we'll get you involved. But first thing we discovered was uh, when we started researching smart cities, and we're indifferent as to whether it's called the city of the future or smart cities, that the mission is basically the same. We discovered that um, there was no universal definition. And so a smart city meant something different for a tech company than it meant for a telecom company or transportation uh, or any of the other areas that, that are involved. And so we tried to develop a very simple uh, definition that we felt would have broad applicability. And we drew this from clients and from people all over the world, from Singapore, and which was mentioned earlier, to Amsterdam and London and Shanghai and Beijing and Cape Town and uh, really all over. And um, the definition that we basically came up with is all about modernizing the city. So smart city modernizes the digital, physical, and social infrastructure of a city on an integrated basis that benefits all of your citizens. And it does this by uh, harnessing sustainable technology in an equitable way. The word equitable, I saw in a lot of pieces of paper that were passed around in that earlier great workshop, equitable really matters. It was, we added that word because of uh, New Orleans City Council President Jason Williams, who insisted on it, it covers way beyond the digital divide. The other thing we discovered is that, well, technology is zooming. And we agree that cities have been improving themselves for, for a couple of thousand years, maybe. But the acceleration now of the technology is a game changer. And our sense is that the technology developments, the fourth revolution that people talk about with artificial intelligence, the, Internet of Things and, and sensor technology, big data analytics, it's moving so fast that the social infrastructure hasn't really adapted and caught up. And that is an underappreciated fact, I think, and needs to be seriously addressed. We're behind on that. Except this one here is a bridge builder. And so when we come to San Antonio, we're meeting with Cheryl Scully, who you heard from earlier, and the mayor, and the leaders, and heads of, uh, of um, universities, and, and board members. Uh, but that's not true everywhere. Jason is working on that in New Orleans, but it's a big deal to get everybody in the same room, and then get members of the community integrated. So I'll stop there, Paul. Okay, well, very good. Well, um, that's a good lead-in, very good lead-in. So, sir. Uh, Councilman and beyond, um, can you kind of share with the with the audience here what what has been New Orleans' view and where are they at and the, the positioning and and you know kind of the immersion of smart cities for for your community? Sure. So when you think about a city that's 300 years old, you don't have to think very hard if you're in San Antonio and you talk to anybody that that gets anywhere close to 100 years old, they'll start telling you about things that aren't working, whether it's a knee or a hip or a vision, what have you. Uh, and the same thing applies to cities. You know, and the infrastructure, if you have not constantly been, been investing in infrastructure needs and foundational needs, then you will find yourself um, in a precarious situation with everything breaking at once, from the sewage and water board to public works and on and on and on. And that's where we found ourselves out at 300. Years. Uh, we had an aging infrastructure that really, that really, you know, and I'm going to be honest, I don't know if there's any other electeds in the room, but when people get elected, they want to they work on projects that get completed during their term, right? They want to be able to cut a ribbon on something. So the idea of investing in something that may not come to fruition completely in 10 years or 20 years, you know, that, that, those sorts of things get pushed the last to last one to do list. But there's so much more important in terms of catching up and being where, where you want to be. So 
after Katrina, we had tons of streets that had to be dug up for because they were bad streets and they had uh, lived, 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 lived a life and, and were now not drivable because uh, we had drainage pumps uh, and pipes that needed to be repaired that had never been touched. So we, we came up with a dig once policy that would allow <coughs> all departments and agencies to get inside of that hole while it was dug up so that we could lay fiber and lay conduit. Uh, so we could make sure that we were ready for 5G while we were dealing with our pipes, while we were de dealing with our streets. Um, and so a lot of that work was happening without the public even knowing that it was happening. But it's also important, as, as I've learned from you and Clint, to bring the public along the way so they get educated on this very specific, very technical stuff so that they realize that this inconvenience in their neighborhood is going to provide a level of connectivity that they've never had before. Uh, we also live in a very poor city. We don't have a large middle class. Uh, we have a lot of people working in the service industry, but working two or three jobs. Um, so they can get by, but we start talking about wayfinders, um, gunshot sensor technology, um, traffic control cameras, water sensor technology, all these things that affect them because when they call the police, they want the police to be able to show up. If four police could show up rather than 10 police because the gunshot sensor technology tells them exactly where to go, then it saves time, it saves resources. You don't have five cops on the scene, on the scene at Jazz Fest or Mardi Gras directing traffic, someone can do it from a desk, right? So these officers are more available. But the public needs to understand how all of that is connected. So we're engaged in a very real educational learning process where a 75-year-old woman understands it, whether she finished high school or not, and I guarantee you every child gets it, uh, just intuitively understand, uh, understands uh, what's this. So they want the 5G, they want to be able to hop on, and they want that level of connectivity, and they know it doesn't exist uh, for their games or for their classes. So, so we're trying to build a foundation, build a foundation um, in terms of public awareness and appreciation about why we're spending money on this, because it's going to take a lot of money, it's going to take a lot of time, but also building a foundation on our infrastructure to make sure that it is prepared to receive all the benefits of the smart city. Okay, well, I, I would say we resemble that remark fully. Um, sir, let's talk about Paramata. Um, do, but, but do us a favor. Um, I don't think we have a view. And, and we actually have slides um, clicking in the background, or I have a manual clicker. I think Loretta is actually helping me here. But we wanted to give you a sense from each one of our areas, and I think here, here, here's one for Paramata, but could you tell us a bit about the community? Tell us a bit, a bit about the work, and, and you, and in many ways, have really done a lot of this, these preliminary things that we're starting to venture into, so can you give, lay the foundation for that? Thank you. Yeah, look, uh, I guess uh, pretty much everyone here will have heard of Sydney as a city, and city, you know, to define a city is, is different all, all around the world, you know, like there are up, up to about 40,000 cities in the United States with an average population of 8,000. So cities are small in the States, apart from obviously San Antonio and, and, and a few other notable ones. Uh, uh, Australia itself, the entire population and which economic output would fit into Texas. So we've got 25 million people in the country, we've got 28 a year, similar GDP, and yet the country's as big as the whole of the US. Our, our cities are bigger, although we only got 600 of them. Uh, they've got about 40 something thousand people, but uh, the biggest cities, obviously, I'm, I'm in a big city. Uh, the greater metropolitan area of Sydney is just under five million. Uh, so it's a big city in any, in any world time. And the cities that collectively make up uh, make up Sydney. Uh, Paramount is right at the centre of that. Uh, we're the oldest inland city in the country. Uh, we're not as old as San Antonio. We were founded in 1788, so, so that's, that, that is old in, in our part of the world. And as a city, we don't do all the things that cities do here. So we don't do policing, we don't do the ET, we don't do schools. So those things are done by the state. So, so the shape of what we do and what we care for in our communities is a little bit different. Uh, 
we started our, our journey, you know, people talked about the sort of stages of development of forming, storming, norming, and performing. And we're sort of at the storming stage now in Parramatta. Uh, we, we, we thought we did the right thing back in 2015, and we got a consultancy to help us figure out what a master plan would be. And we sort of had that done to us rather than doing it for ourselves and, and, and guiding for ourselves. So that was a that was a bit of a challenge. And, and two years later, 2017, our mayor of the city uh, decided that we needed to do it for ourselves and uh, in, invited some people from industry, including myself, to, to form a smart city committee. So our smart city committee has only really been running uh, really technically for about 18 months. And we, we realized that You've got to understand what your city is, and you've also got to understand exactly where you are in renewal of the things that make the city thrive. And I guess in our renewal, you know, we sort of jump down this sort of so-called digital path of the smart city. Thing. We had three different ways to do parking in our city. Three. We had six different digital platforms to engage with citizens, six. And so we sort of have a lot of these sort of silos, and so in some respects, with the DeLorean out the front, we've sort of got, got to go back to the future. We've got to, and so forming the committee and really engaging out the chief information officer of the city wasn't part of our committee. And so I've gone, I'm off the committee, well that guy's on. You know, because we're not we're not going to do this without a teamwork, and we're not going to do it without everybody engaged. So that's those are some of the challenges that we've got as a city. But um, I, I think that's hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective on Parramatta. Well, okay, so good foundation. You can see that we have a wide range of experiences. Um, I want to go back though and talk a little bit more about this data sharing thing because we have. Uh, been able to get some, some information and some guidance uh, from, from Denton's and um, some of the collaboration on that side about things to watch out for. I, I, I harp on it again because making sure that, that the community thinks about trade-offs for information, um, where, where its boundaries are for what, what they want shared. Um, and some people don't mind sharing depending on where it'll go or how it's going to fit them. But I don't know, Clint, do you, can you share a couple of things about what things that you and your firm have actually looked at and things that have come through the, the think tank in terms of, of data sharing? Sure. Uh, first of all, congratulations to this conference on having Fred Bonnewell and a robust discussion of cybersecurity and um, other types of um, data sharing I'm not sure if we got to privacy, there might not have been time, but uh, one of the pillars in our think tank is on these issues because they're so vital. If you look at not just data share, sharing, but if you look at uh, Waterfront Toronto right now, where uh, Google has been involved initially, it's a huge controversy over privacy. And in Canada, it's important to get perspectives from around the world in Canada Privacy is a, is a natural right of the citizens. And so I think of a, a global company within without maybe understanding the local culture and sensitivities to the degree that it might have been helpful. Data sharing is changing pretty fast. We, um, my background is more really started with um, energy and working with cities on grid modernization and things like that. We had to bring in our cyber and our data sharing teams and our telecom teams and our technology teams who've done an awful lot of this on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's, uh, it's really critical. I was glad to hear, uh, maybe it was Felicia, talk about focusing on that uh, issue here in San Antonio up front. Or I guess it was Cheryl Scully. And, well, uh, Felicia talks about it every time she can, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Cheryl was uh, re really on top of that concern, and it's got to get sorted out, and it's not, uh, it's not subject to easy answers. 
So you have to get all the stakeholders in and get people with a lot of experience in data sharing and those type of uh, agreements and get them talking together. Jason, could you, could you keep going down the uh, avenue of kind of talking about how difficult it is to make it simple for your entire community and keep them involved? Um, what is really working in terms of getting everyone still dialoguing without the conversations really breaking down? Um, and do you have any advice for communities? Because, you know, again, I think the passions around what people believe um, in energy, technology, social activities is wide and firm, right? So how is New Orleans doing? So I'm going to steal and take it away from me from here. Uh, that, that phrase has been the storming, norming, forming, storming, forming, storming, norming. Um, because I mean, it really speaks volumes to what you're going to be up against. Trust is probably the first foundational piece that uh, that you have to have moving forward. Um, and it's probably the piece that I see skipped over the most. You know, um, they was talking about the, they put together the master plan, right? But they didn't put together a master plan. Someone put together a master plan for them. And people don't like things done to them, no matter how good it might be, right? right? They want to be asked. They want to be at the table. And when, you, and when you're at the table, they're allowed to prioritize. Because it's, like you said, it's so vast. Um, they would pri prioritize where to start. What would, what would be most life-changing for citizens of New Orleans? Well, that's a big question, because what's life-changing for a citizen of the Lord Knight Ward is very different from what's life-changing from a citizen of the French Quarter or the Lord Garden District. And so we've got to pull those folks to make sure that we're listening to the city so that when we start deploying things, the first things that are deployed have a real impact so that there's an appetite for more. So that has been the struggle, is, is how do you get everyone at the table? Um, how do you explain what the real opportunities are to everyone in a way that they can digest them? And then begin to make these things the norm for folks so that they aren't scared of them. Data sharing scares a lot of people. Um, privacy issues scare a lot of people. Um, and it's a generational piece. Um, people under a certain age will give up all their information if they get something in return for them. Now, it might be streaming music or streaming video or whatever. I mean, but there, there's a quid pro quo that has to happen. And that quid pro quo has to exist for all those generations. So making sure you have electeds involved, uh, the sharpest minds in terms of the technology involved, and your old school infrastructure folks involved. So that when that street is open for those months and people are inconvenienced and dust is all over their homes and businesses, you, you have a list of things that are gonna go in the ground so that people know why I'm in inconvenience and what I have to look forward to. You know, um, interestingly, I mean, I think I heard a little you know, laugh along the way and I think exactly what you said is kind of the complexity of the situation. Some people will give away their data for music rights. They don't have anything to do with each other. So finding value propositions of what people think are worth it, we have to kind of change our linear thinking, right? To be more expansive thinking. So that I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that example because I, I think that's very true. Maybe we can get musicians to give music away and then we can create a smart city or something. Yeah, everybody will just see that long contract and accept it very quickly. <laughs> and then the, the, the music. <laughs> um, ben, uh, you, you and I talked in the back a little bit and you, you have an interesting situation. You started and now you're restarting, so to speak, with a lot of ownership, right? Yeah, look, um, part of our restart was that we realized we didn't really need have one of the main foundations of re really whatever the term is, smart city, future city, whatever, today connectivity and data is so fundamental to evolving places where people live and make them prosper. And to put that in context, you know, globally every day there are about three and a half billion Google searches. So that's a number, three and a half billion. Every hour in our city, in our city of Parramatta, we produce more data points than that every hour. And 
So that's a lot of data. You sort of got to work out, well, if we've got the data infrastructure in our city from last century, maybe two centuries ago, how are we actually going to even share the data? Like putting aside privacy and like even technically, how would we get our heads around making data really available? Because I mean, my undergraduate degree is data science, although we called it statistics back in back in the 80s. And, and I found it was one of the largest public listed IT companies in Australia. So, so, so I've grown up in the data world. And we know that we cannot uh, progress an agenda for the future city without sort of a, what we've got to tend to call a data engineering foundation. So, so that's what we start. We've got to have the core data infrastructure that puts data in the hands of people that have the insight. You know, it's one thing to have a sustainability department, but it's another thing to give them all the data that they need to actually start making insightful decisions about where you're going to go, predict things, and understand where you're going to go next. So I think that's sort of one of the things that we're really worrying about now and trying to address head on. But we're not really funded for it. I mean, the mayor said we were, open, we're implementing open data policy. And I said, well, just hang on a minute. That's going to cost us a lot of money. We, we, we don't actually have the funding to implement an open data policy. So, so we've got that's why we're storming at the moment, but we're working through it. So the, the one thing I will um, add to, to this uh, about, about it, everything sounds simple, right? Like let's, um, let's prioritize and put more renewables in, or let's go and do that sharing. Um, it really does take resource. You have to think about <coughs> whether you're gonna be in the cloud, not going to be in the cloud, you have to think about who's going to be the custodian, who's going, what kind of security levels you need, um, how do you validate that, then when you're sharing, who's your partner on the other side and what they're going to do. I have a very unpopular quote where I said, everything costs money. And the real thing is for a community to, to take inventory of everything it wants to do and start thinking about it. Because the one thing that doesn't cost money ideas, right? But, but really when you try to effectuate those. So that's a great example. So we just have a, we have a little bit of time left and maybe I, I thought I would throw back at the, the, the question that I threw back at Cheryl, but you can take any one of the three options. So I'm gonna go down the list and I'm relative to smart cities and how you look at how people are approaching it or how you're approaching it in your community. Pick either what you think uh, communities should stop doing, what they better make sure continues, um, and um, I, I trip my own self up, continue. So, I'll start with you. I think uh, the differentiator between cities that are really getting somewhere and others that are struggling is how to get to scale really fast because the technology is coming so fast. And um, our premise, working with New Orleans and San Antonio and a number of other cities, is you've got to start by taking big, huge chunks of infrastructure that have to change anyway and that have a built-in funding source. So for example, uh, grid modernization. For the last century, We've had a one direction grid where the utility communicates to the customer. We're now moving to a multi-directional grid where not just the customer makes purchasing decisions, but their appliances will be doing that. So, and that's going to create tremendous benefits for customers and there's a rate base to cover that. So we think part of the initial platform on a smart city, if you really want to get to scale fast, is grid modernization coupled with advanced uh, telecommunications and connectivity, and then layer in other things that are also coming really fast, like mobility and, and autonomous vehicles are gonna be here a lot quicker, I believe, than many people realize. Smart buildings, and there are so many things that you can lead into that without having to spend a huge amount of money. We're, we're working with a uh, trash collection company that calls their trash trucks now something like a mobile data platform because they put sensors on it and cameras and when the trash 
truck picks up uh, uh, trash, is <coughs> monitoring the street to immediately send information on potholes and other things that need to be addressed without having to have a separate costly function for that. Well, very good. All right, Jason. You either want to stop it, continue, or start. Which one? So I would say um, cities have to uh, start with a master plan, and but but not just create it, but create it with real equity, with real input and participation, but figure out ways of institutionalizing the priorities of that plan. Because this is this is a twenty year piece. This is not a four year term piece, and so you've got to figure out a way for the public sector, the private sector alike, to be in line and on one page on what the priorities are for year one and year five and moving forward. Uh, and, and part of that is using the data you have now and sharing that with the public. If you can create public-facing dashboards, uh, for, for, we, we've been collecting crime uh, data for years, uh, recent years in the city, but we're just collecting it. But what we, what we did more recently is Smart and Stables Committee, we, we created a public facing dashboard so you know what crimes were committed in your neighborhood, on your street, on your block, large and small, and where they were committed. So the public really knows how safe they really are, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's information that's digestible, it's accessible, and it sort of teases it up for more to come. And, and just a laser question on that. How frequently do, do you think New Orleans is going to update that plan? Well, the, the, uh, the master plan? Is it the interval? <laughs> is it the interval? Is it at once a year, every few years? I, I think if you, could, if you could have something laid out, you'd have to do it every year. Mm -hmm. But but understanding if you do it every year, then you're looking at very incremental change, right? Um, <coughs> um, if you do anything larger than that, then the people who committed to those priorities are going to be up for re-election or term limited out. So you've got to figure out a way. Maybe it's creating a position of a person that is not elected but will be there for, you, will be there for the long haul because uh, if you've got a traditional utility company, they're going to slow walk a lot of this stuff because it's just not part of their profit model, right? And that's the thing we deal with. The public sector wanting to move very fast, but and you say, no, we like these old wooden poles with termites and water. We don't need one of you dressed poles. You know, and so if I'm AMI, straight of mine, we'll try a couple, we'll do a little pilot, you know, and then somebody else gets elected and is like, oh, we well, have that pilot, we have 100 more homes to the pilot. And so you've got to have those real commitments that, that, and, and, and those um, benchmarks so that somebody feels like the heat's going to be on if they are moving. All right, then you're going to pull up the rear here and kind of help us. You know, which which one do you want to talk about? Yeah, look, I, I think the thing that you, it's pretty easy to articulate the things you must do. You know, I mean, obviously, um, at San Antonio, you think about listening, and, and, and so, so, so all, all, I agree with all of that. The thing that we we've got to stop doing is playing silos. You know, it, it's all about as a city. As, as a relatively small city, we, we can't do it all ourselves, and so, so it can't be done in silos. You know, and, you know even at, at every level in you know, our organisation, you know, we, we have data in silos. You know, we've got SCADA data, we've got geospatial data, we've got citizen and rate based data, we've got AMI data, we've got all this data, and it's all in silos. And one of the one of the, the cool things that we, we're doing with the Lineage in, in Parramatta is we're implementing a Data Angels program. So what we've been doing is we've been encouraging data scientists and data engineers from industry to pro bono contribute to building a much greater level of data savviness in our city to, to, to encourage young people to take roles into data and really increase our capacity as a, as a community to really sort of en enable and, and really empower people with data and, and you can't do that without skills and so, so the Data Angels program is something that I think every city in the world should have a Data Angels program. Data Angels. They're doing it in LA actually. LA City has got a Data, data Angels program and they're doing a great job. Well, the, the one thing I really like about Smart Cities, you're the think tank and everything, you can take these ideas.
So uh, it would be awesome if the globe had data angels all over to help us solve issues. Uh, we went a little long, but I think we had a really good sense of the different great work that's happening around here. I very much want to thank you all for listening to us today. We are all working together to try to make things better. And so I would like to, if you would help me, thank our panelists.